And I want to welcome everybody this evening to the Natural History Society of Maryland's Archaeology Club Meeting for January, where we're going to be learning about environmental archaeology from James Kidd from the Smithsonian's Ar uh, Environmental Archaeology Lab. Jim, thank you so much for sharing, coming and sharing your knowledge and expertise with our community of the curious. We're so excited to learn from you this evening. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, you realize uh, I'm at home in my home office, so I haven't gone anywhere. Uh, easy commute. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Gibb. Uh, I, I'm an archaeologist, yes, and have been for almost 45 years. So it's been a while. I'm the uh, director is perhaps too high sounding a word. I, I sort of uh, sort of ringmaster at the Smithsonian Environmental Archaeology Laboratory. And I'll talk a little bit about what we do there bef uh, before I get too far into this evening's subject. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to note. Uh, first of all, I'm uh, also working currently with um, a Dr. Adam Frackia at the University of Maryland at the colonial port town of Joppa, uh, along with members of the uh, Archaeological Society of the Northern Chesapeake. Joppa is not far too far from where you folks are. So uh, once we get going again out in the field, uh, some of you may want to join us. <clears throat> and uh, I, I, I want to say that the talk I do tonight is based on the work of a lot of people. Uh, it's not my work. Uh, it's work that we do collaboratively. Uh, it's work that's constantly, we're, we're constantly building on what we've done before. Even when a project is published in an academic journal, the, the book is not closed on that particular project. We continue to build on it. So a lot, anyway, a lot of the uh, slides I show you are actually going to have been made uh, by folks of my team. So I'm going to go ahead and share this. Make sure I share the right one. Okay. There we go. Three families, four centuries. We have an interesting situation uh, at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, which we call CERC. Now we call the Smithsonian Environmental Archaeology Laboratory SEAL, so we're the SEAL team. Uh, one of the sites we're working on has actually been in, uh, occupied uh, during the settlement period from 1650s onward by really just three families, the Shaw family in the 17th century, uh, the Selman family in the 18th and 19th centuries, and then the Kirkpatrick Howard family from around 1913 until 2008 when Smithsonian acquired their property. So we're gonna be looking at uh, what, we're looking at how those three families in different ways altered the local environment. Uh, we're an odd program, uh, the Smithsonian Environmental Archeology span Laboratory. We're one of about 20 labs at Smithsonian. We are completely volunteer myself included. Uh, there's no budget. <laughs> uh, we use borrowed equipment. Uh, we have a regular lab space in Matthias Lab, a state-of-the-art facility. Um, and I do want to point out that this is not the way science usually gets done. Science costs money. As our director likes to say, science is expensive. So I'm not holding this up as some sort of example of how science should be done. Uh, we're doing it on the cheap. Well, we're, we're, an, we're an unusual program. We've been in operation for almost nine years now. And we're, we do what we call citizen science. And to me, citizen science is more than just volunteering. The people on our team, a number of whom are participating this evening in this uh, uh, meeting, they don't just, they're not there to help me. We are there to help one another. We take on a whole bunch of projects and we work together on them in small groups and a lot of the groups work without my direct participation. You know, folks will ask questions, but they do the science. They define the questions, the methods, collect the data, do the analysis, and in many cases, report the results at professional conferences. Uh, and in some cases, they've published in professional journals. So that's kind of what we're about. Um, 
things I'd like to cover this evening are what, what can we learn about how you people alter local ecosystems? And I'm going to hit on just three, three things. Uh, landscape transformation, you know, how do we document how people, in most cases intentionally, but in some cases unintentionally, alter the, the, the landscape around them, physically alter that landscape. Second, uh, how can we identify and measure soil loss and redeposition? I can tell you that uh, I've been doing a lot of work in Charles County in Southern Maryland these past uh, eight, nine, nine years now. And if anybody asks me, well, what have you learned from doing all those projects in Charles County? And I will tell them the incredible damage that we have caused to the soils of this state through poor ma land management practices, poor forestry, poor agriculture. And we can see that archeologically. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that this evening. And then finally, species introduction and extirpation. You know, when do certain species arrive in this region, mostly from uh, Europe, but from Asia as well? And what happens to those species that are already here? And archeologically, we can measure these things. The neat thing about studying environment from an archaeological perspective is that we are, as I like to say, we're the time lords. We control time in a sense. Most uh, ecologists look at the here and now and their, their studies go back maybe in some cases a few years, maybe even several decades. Archaeologists go, can go back thousands of years. So we can see ecosystems changing and we can measure those changes and to a certain extent understand what factors are changing those systems. So I'm gonna give you a few examples tonight. We're gonna to start off with landscape transformations. This is an aerial view of a part of CERC today. Uh, we are some 2,650 mostly contiguous acres around the Road River. So it's a pretty large sandbox for archeologists to play in. It is our laboratory. We have a very high tech, sophisticated lab building, but the entire facility is our laboratory. And there are all kinds of experiments going on in terms of forest ecology, marine ecology, fish ecology, you name it, it gets done there. And let's see if I can get my pointer going here. There we go. Um, one area I want you to look at here is down here is one of um, our landing sites, Conti's Wharf. And there's a small community down here, uh, descendants of the Bergman family from around early 20th century. Well, our property line literally comes up to the walls of their buildings here. All this that you see here, virtually all of this is uh, the Smithsonian land. Now, this landscape has changed. Uh, I mean, you, you look at it today and it looks very bucolic. Uh, open fields that are still cultivated, at least out the farmers, lots of woodland. It really looks quite nice. And I've heard many people come and say, well, this is what most of Maryland used to look like. And they couldn't be more wrong. Uh, most of the forest you see today, uh, through up and down the East Coast, only, only is 60 to 80 years old. Massive areas of the Eastern United States were deforested in the 1920s. It was a real concern on the part of the national government and the various state governments about loss of timber. What are we gonna build with? So most of what you see today is what has grown back largely by our move out of an agricultural economy and into first industrial then services economy. Well, so that's, that's Bergmanville you see there, those white houses, little enclave. Well, that's, that's, that's Bergmanville. <laughs> Uh, in the in, in, in early 1900s. It was a steamboat landing and it had been from probably the 1830s until about 1930. Uh, the Great Depression and automobile traffic pretty much put an end to steamboats. But it was an active landing where farmers brought produce and some of the wealthier people in this region would get on those steamboats and came on up to Baltimore uh, for school, for shopping, to spend some weeks with family or friends. Uh, it was an important social connection for the wealthier folks. Obviously, it doesn't look like that anymore. Uh, this is one view of our state-of-the-art building, which is, oh, must be five or six years old now. Um, uh, 
uh, environmentally uh, sensitive, recycling water, storm water, uh, uh, compostable toilets, solar panels, you name it. Uh, so we, the Smithsonian, have made our mark on this landscape. But this is what that same spot looked like in 1935. It was a dairy farm, which in and of itself would be unusual for this part of Maryland. We didn't do a lot of dairying, um, but it was a model dairy farm. Uh, most of the area around it was open pasture. Uh, of course, now all that is wooded except for where our laboratory is. So how do we, how do we study landscapes? We're archeologists, we're not landscape architects. What the hell do we know about any of this? Uh, well, we have a lot of skills that help us um, cross uh, disciplinary boundaries. We're cartographers, we're great at making maps, or at least should be. Uh, Archaeology is first and foremost about space. Where are things? The black line you see on this topographic map pretty much mark the bounds of uh, the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. We might have pushed out a little bit here and there with some more recent purchases. The map's a little bit old. You'll see those two red ellipses on there. Those uh, mark two of our major research areas uh, in the last uh, nine years, north part of campus. And all those little blue circles and ellipses, those are all archeological sites that have been registered. They're not all the archeological sites that are out there. They're those just have been found and registered with the state. And uh, a lot of them are Native American, but a lot of them are uh, historic here as well. So if one of the first things we do is, you know, we know who owns the property today. You know, we do. So we can look at land records, which in Maryland are online, and you can do this for free. You can get an account with the Maryland State Archives and do your own title search. But we go back and trace the ownership of the property. Let me go to this next one here first. For the area we're looking at where the Selman House is, these are the owners. We can trace them back from where we are today, our purchase in 2008, and we could trek it right back to Lord Baltimore in 1672 for one parcel, 1666 in the case of another one. And then a lot of those uh, deeds will have surveyor's descriptions of the property. So we've managed to reconstruct them. Our site is right here in this red box, more or less. This is what's called Selman's Connection, this large track here. And these are adjoining tracks that date to the, 16, uh, to the 17th and 18th centuries. We reconstructed all of these things on paper, and then we can put them on modern maps so we know which tract of land we're on and therefore who owned it and, and presumably who lived on it. So I don't know how many of you folks have used LIDAR. Uh, you can access this for free uh, for Maryland. LIDAR is a means of um, essentially creating topographic maps by flying uh, aircraft at high altitudes they emit pulses along the EM spectrum. Those pulses hit the ground and bounce back at different levels. They hit the forest canopy and they can also go down to the ground. And the aircraft then records the response, the, the, the rebound. And it produces a, a photograph. It looks like a photograph, a black and white, a great halftone photograph. And you could look at an image of just showing the tops of the trees. So you could look at the current forest canopy and some one of our labs does that a lot, forest ecology. Or you could do it the way most people do and actually look at the ground. So this is essentially what that ground surface looks like. And here is the property, one of the properties we're talking about and, uh, where the Selman house is located about here. It was called Selman's Connection, spelt that way. Uh, I know how to spell, uh, that's, they spelt it with an X. And you could see some of the topography here. Obviously, you could see the roads coming through. You can see ravines and drainages where streams are, spring-fed streams, perhaps, or maybe this is just stormwater runoff. You could see a little clump of trees here, a little sort of rise that hasn't been plowed. And also, you could see, just make out this kind of rectangle here. And I'll get back to what that's all about in a moment. So this is a topographic map that was generated based on those LIDAR images. And again, if you know how to use geographic information systems, you could download this information for free and create your own maps. 
But this is that little tongue right here. Here's the house. Here's the main road that comes in, goes down to the steamboat landing. There's sort of a tongue of land here and you can see it's terraced. This, these are artificial terraces. Uh, when this house was built in 1735, the uh, landowners uh, basically sculpted the land, created these terraces for fancy gardens. Actually, the landowners didn't do it, their slaves did it, but um, they ended up with terraces in any case. And if you go out there today with a keen eye, you can actually see the remains of these terraces. They're not as pronounced as some. Um, here's an aerial view of the house. I'm not sure what it dates to. Don't mind the dates down here. They refer to this part of the house was built in 1735. This part was built in 1841. The photograph doesn't date to any, either one of those years. Uh, but this is the road that goes down to the landing. And all this, you really can't see it in an aerial photograph, but all of these are sculpted terraces. Uh, probably around 1970, the then owners even put a swimming pool on one of those terraces. Just down the road, about a quarter of a mile, is another mansion site. This one up here, it's a ruin. Um, but it was located right here. And this is a LIDAR image uh, done in color, gives you a slightly different perspective. Look at what looks like a staircase. Each of these terraces, each of the risers on these terraces is about oh, four or five feet. So there's a huge amount of soil that was moved. And there, there was terracing on this side and this side as well, I think. It's just that they're badly eroded and they're not as visible. But the result is they've taken a hilltop and turned it into a rectangle. Now, if that isn't landscape transformation, I don't know what is. Much more pronounced than over at the Selman House. So that's an example of landscape modification. There are other examples, and we look at some of those, but we're just sort of skimming the top this evening. Another thing we do a lot of is measure soil loss. And not just the loss of that soil, but where does it go? You know, you, what does it mean to lose soil? It's got to go somewhere, right? So working around the Selman House, one of the first things we did, uh, and this is, uh, you know, almost nine years ago we started. This was, I think, July of 2012. And one of the first things we did was we, all these little dots here rep represent shovel test pits. Every seven meters, we're on Smithsonian property, we use metric. Every seven meters, we dug a shovel test pit. It's about a foot and a half in diameter at most, goes down a foot, two feet, screen the soil, describe the soils, collect the artifacts that we've screened, bag them up by unit. We then catalog that material. And then using a computer program, uh, we do what's called trend surface analysis. We tell a computer, okay, we have so many nails in this hole, so many in this, no nails uh, in that, maybe ceramics, in this case, uh, uh, grams of coal or coal ash. And the computer will generate what's essentially a topographic map. So here's the house here. Here's what the computer is telling us about the distribution of coal ash. It's actually sliding down the hill. Now, when these people threw out trash, presumably this is one of their target areas, presumably maybe up here. But what's happened is that coal ash has drifted down the slopes along with the soil. This in and of itself tells us something about what's going on and that there is a certain amount of what's called soil creep and stormwater erosion. Uh, well, in a moment, we'll talk a little bit about our shovel test pits down here in an excavation unit we've got over here. We were interested in where all that soil went. You know, clearly some of it went down the slope and into the adjoining field, but not all of it. In front of the house, let me go back for a moment. In front of the house, you don't see it on this map, we found uh, a structure. And after quite a bit of excavation, it's pretty clear to me that it was a summer kitchen. This is a kitchen, a separate building used for cooking, especially during the warmer months because it's Southern Maryland and cooking inside a brick house is, you know, can get uncomfortable without air conditioning. So they had a summer kitchen here and that summer kitchen was probably occupied by slaves too because it was a heated building. You didn't have to build another house for them. So perhaps household slaves were there. But we did some extensive excavation there and found initially a, uh, a field stone foundation and then also a brick addition to it. And you could see a drawing of part of that right here. 
the brick and the stone were about two inches below the sod. I mean, just sticking the shovel in the ground, you could boom, you were hitting that foundation. And yet when we excavated around, we found that this foundation doesn't go into the ground more than one or two courses of brick. Now you can't, you can't build a structure on bricks like that or stone like that and expect it to stay there. You know, you need a sturdier foundation that's deeper into the soil and also comes up above the soil. So you get the wood above ground so it doesn't get termite eaten. So clearly not only is this just a trace of a foundation but a lot of the soil that was on top of it is gone. And I would estimate that we've lost about a, at least a foot and a half of soil here at this location. So if you stood on that spot, let's say 200 years ago, you would have been a foot, a foot and a half higher in elevation than you would be today. That's not unusual. We see that all over Maryland in the uplands. So what we did was we dug a series of, um, I'm pointing at the screen as if you could see that, uh, a series of excavation units here and one down the hill. And one of our number, one of the original members of our merry band uh, who now lives in Paris with her opera singing uh, uh, husband, uh, she did an analysis of just ceramic sherds that were recovered from these excavation units and just looked at the weight of those sherds and looked at the average weight of sherds for this group of units, this group, and this one down here. I think I have an image. And what we were thinking, our hypothesis was that, you know, the size of the sherds would decrease as you went down the hill. And that would suggest that the, you know, that is the direction of erosion. So we have basically two hypotheses. We have an automotive driveway here that dates to sometime in the early 20th century. It is deeply eroded. It's about five feet deep at one point. So it's uh, just, from, just from use. So this soil from this driveway had to go somewhere and had to wash down here. But we also have soil from here that had to wash down. And we're still trying to figure out which soil ended up down here or did they come mixed together and did they come down at the same time? Uh, the shirt size did drop off as expected. Um, but when we dug a series of shovel test pits down along the slope, we created this uh, kind of schematic profile what the soils look like as you go down the hill. So this is the surface here. And this PP19, 18, 17, 16, these are just shovel test pits. We dug uh, you know, a few meters apart. And we found the same soils in each shovel test pit. However, the elevation of those soils and their thickness varied. So the first two, we got sort of a recent topsoil and topsoil below that. And then we got sort of a deeper deposit and a very deep deposit. This red deposit here, that's the original surface. That was actually plowed at one time. That is the original plowed field. And it, it is as much as four feet below grade today. That is four feet of sediment have formed on top of that surface. We don't know when that soil was plowed. The only artifacts we got out of it from our one excavation unit down there were uh, Indian pottery sherds. <laughs> so it doesn't help us very much. Yeah, we figured it was plowed sometimes, sometime after the late woodland period some thousand years ago, but how much more recently we, we haven't figured out yet. What we've done, this is Sarah Grady here in the unit. What we did uh, after excavating this unit down the hill and you can't see it all looks the same here, but there are actually all sorts of lenses of soil that go all the way down uh, just about four feet. We ended up coming back a couple of years later, re-excavating that hole. And then what Sarah has done here is she's taken soil samples out of the sidewall every five, I think every five centimeters all the way down. And then analyze the grain size of those soils. And I won't try to explain this graph in too much detail. Suffice it to say that the lighter blue lines represent the deeper deposits, which are on top and tend to be finer grained. And the darker lines represent the upper soils, which are coarser grained. And that just suggests that the initial finer grained soils up the hill washed down first and the erosion continued to cut into the coarser grained subsoil. So basically, 
they flipped over the soil column. Uh, one thing hey, I Jim? can't, yes. Jim, Jim, quick question. Phil Curtis wanted to know the, the red layer, the earliest layer that was plowed. How did you know? What did you see that, that led you to, to understand that that was plowed? It is just a classic plowed soil. It's dark and organic. It had a very abrupt uh, transition to the underlying soil, which is clearly what we call a, a B horizon. It's, it's undisturbed. Uh, in fact, not only did we think this, but we had a rather prominent geologist from the University of Maryland bring a class of students out to look at other things. And we happened to have this unit open. And he climbed down there and said, yep, that's a plow zone. <laughs> so um, there are a number of criteria we use, but it's very distinct from the soils above it. And of course, it's very, it's continuous down the hill. Okay. Thank you. One thing we're, we're just, we were just on the verge of making a major uh, leap forward. Uh, two of our team, George Weisling and uh, Chloe Meyer, uh, have come up with a fairly safe way of extracting pollen grains from the soils. Typically, I mean, it's been going on for many years, but uh, palynologists usually use some very strong acids, which are quite dangerous. Well, they came up with a way of using some fa fairly uh, weak acids. And so we just uh, a few weeks ago finally purchased a digital microscope. Uh, Tim Boders, one of our team, has figured out how to mount my brand new digital camera on top of it. And so this is among the first photographs we've taken of the pollen. Uh, our next step is to spend about 20 bucks to get a, a micrometer that goes into the lens and goes onto the stage of the microscope so we can actually measure the pollen grains and also establish kind of a grid across this thing. So what we'll do is we'll take a series of photographs, stick that from each of those, I think they're 20 or 25 layers uh, samples that uh, uh, Sarah took, and we can send out those PowerPoint files to individuals who can go through and, and using a guide, identify the pollen grains, the species, or the, to some taxonomic level, and count them. And then what we can do is look at the distribution of different species of pollen as they go down through the soil column. Now, around the Selman house, you, I mentioned earlier that the third family to live there were the Kirkpatrick Howitt family. They were arborists. They collected trees. We have a redwood tree in front of the Selman house, as well as numerous uh, varieties of magnolia and other trees. Those trees produce pollen. Presumably in these samples, we're gonna see when those, the pollen from those trees shows up. And that will be our marker for some time in the early 20 or early mid 20th century. And anything below that will be earlier. And so we'll be able to look at the uh, the changing vegetation regime over X number of years. We don't know how many yet. And we'll be using this technique on other sites as well. So stay tuned. Okay. Uh, I then want to talk about, you know, how do we look at changes to the floral and, uh, I have floral and plant communities. How about that? I meant to say the faunal and plant communities. We're looking at animals and plants, typo. And that's actually one of the things uh, I specialize in. I deal with bones, animal bones. We've got the Selman, uh, Selman's connection here. And this was occupied by, the Selman family bought it in 1727, I think. The house was built in 1735. There's some evidence to suggest that there was a temporary building here before 1735. And then the house was expanded in 1841. And the summer kitchen's located over here. Well, several hundred feet out behind the Selman house, out in the middle of a cornfield, we have Shaw's Folly, which is a 17th century site. We know the Shaw family was here in the 1650s, uh, 1660s. The archaeological data suggests a little bit earlier. Uh, they patented the land first in 1666. It looks like they might have been living there about 10 years earlier. And it was found by just, you know, the farmer plowed the fields and artifacts showed up. And so we came along and found those artifacts on the surface. We flag them 
and then using this total station, map those artifacts in. And that way we could see where they clustered, create a map, see where the artifacts cluster. After we did that, we came through, and this again, this is a Sarah Grady product. Um, we went in and used metal detectors across the area where we thought the site was. And every time we had a hit, we flagged it. We didn't dig it up. We assume we, if we hit a lot of these metal uh, magnetic objects, chances are they would be nails. And if you got nails, you got a building, right? So that's what all those blue dots are. They are metal hits. And then we used our surface trend analysis, the same as we did with the coal ash, but around Selman House, to see where the concentration is. And clearly, this is where they're concentrated, right here. And this is where most of our excavation units were uh, excavated. Laid on this also, however, is a magnetometry map. Uh, here's the back of Dr. Laura Cripps, a friend of mine who's a professor and a dean or something at uh, Howard Community College. She came out with a magnetometer, which is a device that um, measures the uh, change in magnetic fields uh, in, in the air around us, the ambient magnetism, as well as that at the ground. And so it's a technique that helps us identify, almost take a picture of what's below ground. And that's what this gray halftone um, uh, image is here. It's not a photograph, it's a computer simulation. But look at this cluster, this thing here and this here, corresponding very nicely with our nail distributions. Clearly there's some sort of archeological feature there. And over here that I've drawn a red rectangle around, look at this, there's some sort of rectangle that's showing up. So it looks like this may be the house and this is the midden or trash deposit left by the family. So we went in and did some excavation. This is a plowed field. So we just shoveled off the plow zone going down maybe a half a foot. And this is all trash midden. Um, this is midden that has survived plowing. Normally in this kind of setting, you know, the farmers plowing every year would have just destroyed most of this deposit. We might find deeper you know, hole, holes that people dug, cellar holes, for instance, filled with trash. But the surface middens where they're throwing their trash initially would have been just mixed up with the plowed soil. The thing is, this property was a pasture throughout the 20th century. The Kirkpatrick Howitts raised prized beef. Uh, so there's very little mechanical plowing, motorized plowing. And that is what's really damaged the soils around here in recent years. Not that they weren't damaged before, uh, but motorized plowing, you know, you, you, you hook up a plow to a big tractor, bigger and bigger tractors with bigger and bigger motors. There's really not much they can't go through. Because this was in pasture throughout the 20th century and only rarely plowed, this site, this portion of the site has survived. Those oyster shells are the remains of meals these people ate. Those oyster shells, because they're calcium, lower the acidity in the soil, which means bone can preserve very nicely. Not to mention all kinds of other trash that these folks threw out. Some of the things we throw, I'll just throw a few artifacts in to give you a sense of how we can date the site. For one, we find the fragments of uh, casement windows, sort of like you see on churches with the lead and glass. Well, here's a, a fragment of lead. And when the uh, glazier made this window, he had in his uh, machine where he's sort of turning out, turning out these leads, he had embossed his initials WM, and these are just sort of decorative marks, 1671. You know, who could ask for more, right? Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that's when the house was built. Chances are the house was there for quite some time, and this was an improvement made to the house in later years. This same identical uh, lead came, as they're called, or window lead. Uh, they, they've been found at another site, Sparrow's Rest, just down the road, and also at historic St. Mary City. We find lots of tobacco pipes. We can date the styles. We can come up with approximate dates by measuring the bore, the hole that runs through the stem. I won't go into that this evening. But a lot of these pipes also have maker's marks uh, that tell us who manufactured the pipe back in uh, England, uh, some cases Scotland, uh, and the Netherlands. You know, L.E., for instance, Llewellyn Evans, the Welshman. Uh, so we know when he was active. 
So that helps us date the site. And we've got, you know, run a mill other, you know, we've got a, a, a latine spoon, a lead seal that probably held together twine on a bale of fabric. One of the major imports to the colonies would have been fabric because that's not something we made here. And we have ceramics from uh, probably Northern Italy, probably in, in around uh, Pisa, Pisa, Italy. Uh, not all of these are from Shaw's Folly. Actually, these two uh, North Italian slipware are from Shaw's Folly. This piece is actually from the site down the road. Same thing here. This group is from Shaw's Folly. This group is from Sparrow's Rest. And that tells us these households were dealing with the same merchants, same source. And a really unusual find is this bone handle from a fork or a knife. It has, it's hard to read, but it has inscribed on it, T-H-O for Thomas, S, S-P-A-R-O-W, Sparrow, Thomas Sparrow. Thomas Sparrow patented the land just down the road where these other ceramics came from. They were in-laws. And so Thomas Sparrow's eating utensil wound up on the Shaw's site. So one of the things we've looked at is oyster shells. We find a lot of these. We have a group of folks who uh, did that analysis. Uh, Katie Cannon at the time, uh, you see here was a high school student. And along with Leo Plourd, who's you know, on this meeting, and uh, I think Jim Breedlove uh, worked on this as well, and uh, a couple of other folks. Uh, they came up with some really innovative ways of measuring oyster shells so we can look at them quantitatively and compare them to oyster shells recovered from other sites of the same period, also those earlier and later. Uh, I won't go into the specific methods. Uh, Katie, by the way, I think is in her second or third year at Duke University now. And so they looked at uh, the, the sort of essentially the length of the oyster shell. Well, if we just look at that for one site, it's not very interesting. It doesn't tell us anything. So for comparative purposes, that's the red, uh, the uh, blue dashed line. The red dashed line is from a slave quarter site down by the wharf. And it dates to the late 18th, early 19th century. So it's a good deal later. And you can see they're more or less similar in terms of length, except the bigger oysters at Shaw's Folly, which is much earlier, are a lot bigger than the big ones at Shaw, at uh, the slave quarter. If we look at volume, and that's what you saw Katie doing when she was filling the valves with uh, sand, scraping it off, weighing the sand, and the sand, the weight of the sand became a proxy for the volume of the shell. And so you can see here, in terms of volume, the ones at Shaw's Folly were held a lot more meat, basically, once you got into the larger sizes compared to those at the slave quarter. And we can compare these values to other sites as well and start looking for patterns. But initially, just looking at this, you'd have to say uh, European settlers preying on these oysters had some sort of impact on the size of those oysters by overharvesting, one would guess. Uh, the oysters just weren't allowed to get larger. Uh, there's some debate as to how much you can tell about what kind of bottom, how deep the water is, and what that, whether the bottom was muddy or sandy or what, or just oyster reef from the shape of the oysters. But clearly, in looking at the height of the, or essentially the length of the shell versus its width, uh, there are differences between these two sites. And so we can tell that the Shaw's Folly oysters are different from those at Conti's Wharf. At this point, we just don't know why they're different, if they actually came from different kinds of beds. Okay. Um, so hey, I did. Jim, Jim, yes. A question. Nancy was interested when you were talking about the midden that you found and how it differed because the, the, it was a cattle and not plowed field all the time. What did you mean when you mentioned that um, the agricultural activity destroyed the soil? Is it fertility or other aspects? As early as the oh, probably 1820s, uh, observers were saying, look, we're destroying the soil. Uh, we're, we're causing what they call soil exhaustion, which uh, it looks like is a combination of loss of fertility and actual loss of soil. Uh, Patrick Henry, the noted Virginia statesman, uh, Revolutionary War, uh, no one's been able to track this down, 
but he is alleged to have said he is the most patriotic who stops up the most gullies. And gulling, you know, soil erosion was a major problem. But George Washington, we know from his uh, diary and letters that during the winter, he'd have his uh, enslaved women go out in the field and fill in these holes, essentially. So this is a longstanding problem. Uh, by the end of the Civil War, it was quite severe where a lot of Maryland families started moving west. A lot of them picked up and moved to Kentucky. By the 1890s, believe it or not, we at the state formed a Bureau of Immigration where we were actually going out and looking for immigrants, mostly from Eastern Europe and eventually from the Western United States to come to Maryland to reoccupy those exhausted lands. And you could read, I mean, they'd say, well, there are railroads, there are steamboats, there's a great market, there's Baltimore, it's great. Well, the soil's not so good. <laughs> it needs to be fertilized. And there's a big effort to manufacture fertilizer and whatnot. At any rate, you know, soil exhaustion has been a problem throughout most of our history. In another talk, I talk about how it dates, it predates the Revolutionary War. Uh, so by the time the soil is already in rough condition, and in the 1920s, we start getting more and more motorized agricultural equipment in, and that really tears up the soil. Uh, the heyday of artifact collecting was probably the 1930s to the 1950s when those big tractors was just coming through and digging deep and artifact collectors were out there finding all kinds of stuff that we just don't see anymore. And it's because that's when a lot of those sites were destroyed. Anyway, uh, I brought you back to this map again because uh, we're gonna be looking a little bit at Sparrow's Rest, which was occupied by the Sparrow family from the, probably again from the 1650s into the early 18th century as a comparator for Shaw's Folly. From these sites, we get lots of bone. Uh, this in the upper left is a right mandible from a pig. We have some beef bones here. This is a left mandible from a cow. And that's one of our North Italian slipware uh, sherds there. Lots of oyster shells, some bone. We get fish bone uh, of various sorts. A lot of it looks like it's uh, rockfish, white perch. Um, uh, and in some of the inland sites, we find catfish. Uh, this is this is actually a big project that we've started. Uh, we've got several people working on it. Mike Trish, who started with us uh, just before entering uh, undergraduate school at uh, Johns Hopkins. He's now a first year doctoral candidate at Yale University. Uh, Sophia Futrell, who's on in on this meeting, uh, is I think 16 now, a uh, high school student. She's uh, quite a whiz at identifying bones from fragments. I mean, we don't, this is really great shape, this pig mandible, most of our stuff is pretty fragmentary. So uh, Sophia and her mom, Luce, you know, they're becoming uh, quite expert at this as Mike Trish has become quite expert. So we've been going through various sorts of collections identifying uh, the, the bones so we can uh, do a, a larger work, probably a book on colonial dietary patterns. So uh, this is a graph originally put together by one of our early sci uh, citizen scientists, Kylie Gilbert. And this is the species from Shaw's Folly and also from the site down the road, Sparrow's Rest. And the red are Shaw's Folly, the blue are Sparrow's Rest. And you can see there's a sort of, you know, they're similar. And you can see that uh, the focus is on pig and cow, uh, a little bit of sheep, not much. And what's interesting is that here's deer, uh, rockfish rabbit. These folks aren't doing a lot of hunting and fishing. They're, they're focused on livestock husbandry. They're trying to reproduce the diet they had back in the old world, or at least hope they would have back in the old world. And, you know, they're Englishmen for the most part. You know, they want beef. They want a little bit of pork, maybe some mutton. They want white bread. They want beer. They want mushy peas. That's what they're about. Uh, we have references to in the observations from the 1650s, 1660s of people saying basically venison again, Ugh. you know, these are people who probably never put a morsel of deer in their mouth for their entire lives back in the old world because deer were the province of the aristocracy and deer parks owned by the aristocrats. 
they come here and deer all over the place and they rapidly get tired of them. And so what they're really trying to do is do what they couldn't do back home, which is to establish a classic English diet. Not necessarily a healthy one. So, but the thing is, even looking at this graph, you'll notice something. Sparrows rest. There seems to be a preference for beef, and this is based on number of identified bone fragments. They seem to prefer beef to pork, as opposed to Shaw's Folly, where they seem to prefer pig to beef. And what that suggests is two different uh, livestock husbandry practices. Now, whether it's based on food preferences or, you know, capital, they have enough money to raise, you know, we don't know. But they're clearly practicing two different strategies. And those two strategies on farms that basically abut one another are going to have different effects on the local environment because beef cattle uh, affect the land form and vegetation in one way, and pigs do so in another way. Now, we don't have our arms around exactly what those differences are at this point, but clearly there are differences. So, you know, pig, you know, cow, pig, you know, these, these just, just seeing that difference is important. And what I'm doing with Mike and Sophia and Luz is we're looking at collections from other sites, not only on campus, but across Southern Maryland from different periods and different environmental settings to see if we get some handle on different strategies of meat provisioning. And we're also looking at plants. Um, I guess I'm not gonna talk about plants tonight. So I'm just gonna kind of wrap this up. It's been a bit now. So we've looked at land tra landscape transformation. In this case, you know, very obvious physical alteration of the land, very intentional with the creation of terraces. And those terraces would have been planted with all sorts of exotic plants in geometric patterns, it would have been, you know, think the gardens at Versailles. And the object here is these are elite families and they often have guests visiting them for weeks at a time. You know, turn on PBS and watch a Jane Austen film and, and you, you get a sense of, you know, what's going on amongst the elite. And when they visit one another, not only are they, uh, do the host show a great deal of hospitality with with wine and drink, you know, with drink and food and all that, but they also show off, you know, their fancy, you know, their furnishings, their landscaping, and those things demonstrate uh, a knowledge of geometry, botany, and most of all, fashion. So the object of these terrace gardens, to a large extent, is to impress one another. And impressing one another is important because you may want to borrow money from uh, a, a fellow elite, or you, uh, well, you got to marry off your kids, right? Who do you want to marry them to? You want to have your, ma your daughter marry somebody like me? Or do you want, want her to marry some guy who's the son of a very, you know, scion of a wealthy family and, you know, can be, you know, live well. Uh, and also these, through this network of elites, you also get uh, choice positions in government like collector of taxes. You know, if you're the collector of taxes, you don't actually go out and collect anybody's money. You have people who do that and you skim off the cream. So you make a fair amount of money without having to work for it. So impressing other people in your class, in the elite class, is really important. And that's what these terrace gardens are about. Soil loss and redeposition. We saw that at the Salmon House with the summer kitchen. You know, most of that site has washed downhill along with what is now an automobile driveway. And we've been able to measure that. What we've not been able to do yet is date when that, those different deposits, when did they happen? Uh, and we are in the process of looking at changing uh, vegetation regimes through the pollen that we've recovered from those soils. And finally, you know, we could see what's going on with animal husbandry you know, and, and just food getting in general. Uh, there's a lot of reliance on oyster harvesting. Uh, Several of my guys, you know, we just finished digging a plantation site near Bowie, Maryland. Nowhere near oyster beds, very few oysters around. Uh, clearly a different food getting strategy than those people who live along the coast or along these major rivers like the Selmans. Uh, but we also see uh, with the inland sites, we're seeing 
deer showing up. These folks, even, even on later period sites, these folks seem to be eating a lot more venison than they are over uh, on these, these cirque sites. That's kind of interesting. Um, so we're trying to put all these pieces together, look at not only social differentiation, you know, how people sort themselves out into essentially different classes, but also how individual households alter the environment in different ways. We don't all have the same impact on our local environment. My neighbor, uh, she, I think she stopped doing this, but she, every year she'd rake and rake her lawn to get up all the, the dead grass exposing the sand beneath. Well, whenever it rains, all the sand washes away. So all of her sod, you could see the, about one inch of the roots. <laughs> My grass, which I hardly ever even mow, <laughs> So it kind of looks terrible, but I don't, we don't lose any sediment here. And so that's just one example of how different households affect the local ecosystem differently. And we're just above an impound portion of the Chesapeake Bay, uh, a large pond, uh, a lake. So anyway, uh, that's what I hope to cover this evening. And I thought I'd you know, talk a little bit about what it is that each of us can do. Uh, and so I put together a little list here. Uh, first of all, when you're going out into the world, and especially if you're a docent, you're taking people on hikes, whatever, you're talking about the environment, it is absolutely critical that you get across to people that what they see today is all 20th century. There are few or no old growth forests around here. What they're looking at are forests of the last 60 to 80 years. A friend of mine did some archaeology in Rock Creek Park some years ago, and they were digging up the remains of a farmstead in the middle of this woods along Rock Creek Park. And they can hear people walking through and talking about how it's natural and hasn't been altered by the hand of man. <laughs> well, you've got archaeologists digging up a foundation <laughs> next to them. I mean, uh, we need people to understand that the world we see today is not the world that existed a half century ago, a century ago and more. And I think that's really important for understanding change in general. Uh, as I you know, gave that example of my neighbor and her raking, consider how your activities around your own house lot affect even in the smallest way, the environment. Are you encouraging sediments to wash down onto your streets and eventually into storm drains and into uh, waterways, that is happening. Uh, all, and the very fact that water is flowing off your property, it's going somewhere, it's building up volume and force and causing damage. How can you keep water on your property? Um, a problem that comes up in my community all the time is we like to kill our way out of inconveniences. You know, we're paying taxes so the county will, if we want, spray insecticide for mosquitoes. And so people demand, well, we should get our money's worth. And all these mosquitoes, you know, they're a pain. Well, you, you can't kill yourself out of problems like that. For one thing, poisons aren't killing the mosquitoes we want killed anyway. For another thing, we're trying to encourage bluebirds and other birds around here, which rely on insects for food. And there we are, you know, bluebird box out in the front lawn and the truck comes along spraying poison all over it. Uh, same thing with, you know, beaver, you know, Beavers make dams, and that's just what they do. And they deforest. I had a neighbor talk about this. Oh, there's a beaver down the road and he's cutting down trees. And I was like, well, where the hell do you think your house came from? <laughs> we cut down trees too. And so we need to learn how to live with the world and maybe to establish a degree of balance. Deer, you know, white-tailed deer are a problem all over the place because they seem they seem to be at, at a high population levels. So I'm not sure if that's true or not. But you know, if we let foxes live, if we let the coyote re-establish uh, themselves around here, I've, I've picked up three dead fawns in my community over the past year, and they were killed by foxes. The fox is a natural predator for young deer. You know, that's the way the world works. Going around and shooting them doesn't really solve the problem. You need to reestablish that balance. So anything you can do to discourage neighbors from doing these draconian measures and to think more in terms of reestablishing balance would be very important. Uh, being cognizant about food choices, uh, they have ecological ramifications. 
you know, Americans love their beef. Where does beef come from nowadays? A lot of it, you know, comes from the Southwest. And I've worked out there. I can't imagine raising beef cattle on the land I saw out there, but people do it. And it just wreaks havoc. And of course, down in Amazonia, major source of American beef. In order to get the, those pastures, you got to cut down trees. So when you're thinking about what you want to eat, what your preferences are, that's something to consider. And finally, and perhaps most important, importantly, join us at CERC. <laughs> I mean, granted, you know, the, we, we're in, living in the plague year here, uh, but this too shall pass. And I really encourage folks to come down and play with us. Uh, again, you get to take on projects by yourself or with more typically with small groups and really take it from beginning to end to actually be the scientist rather than simply being a volunteer. Uh, also, for those who don't want to make the trip, we are gearing up in Joppa Town, and I think that's going to provide opportunities for a lot of folks in your end of the woods. Uh, I think that's all I had for this evening, so I'll answer questions. Great, Jim. Can you stop sharing? We can all come back together. Yeah, I'm trying to. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, if anybody has questions, you want to put your uh, camera back on or raise your hand or type it in the chat box uh, so you can acknowledge you. Ilka. Um, if anybody has a chance to check out the LIDAR maps for Maryland, they're really fascinating. Um, one of the things I've been doing during COVID is I found a house that's down the street from me. And uh, I believe it was the home of Richard Padian, who they named Padonia Road after. Now he later went on to live in Taylor Hall, which some people know in Cockeysville is a very historic home. But this little hilltop house um, is not documented except on old maps. And Jim, I wanted to ask you, when you're doing land records searches, um, I came across an old deed to the property and it talked about, it, this is as far back as I could go. And it was like the late 1800s. And they're talking about, it went, the property goes from the white oak over to the black oak and the boundary stone that's there to you know so many degrees this way. Have you ever found boundary stones? Do they still exist in Maryland? They do. And in fact, the Maryland Historical Trust keeps an inventory of them. Uh, we have a lot of them in, um, in the, particularly in the area around um, uh, the bridge, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, and over in Gamble's area. Uh, they do exist. Uh, if you find them, it's good to get an exact location, description, photograph and let them know at the Maryland Historical Trust so they can keep track of them and help preserve them. Uh, we do, I was out at, um, oh, what's that place called? Out by, um, we were looking at African-American community, a one-room schoolhouse, Dana Link and I, uh, and that was the kind of description we had. I mean, we had meets and bounds, you know, degrees and distances, but it used stones. And Dana <laughs> found the stone found the basic stone. So uh, with a high degree of confidence, we've reconstructed uh, the boundary of that property. It's Boyd's, what is it, Boyd's turn? Uh, Boyd, it's just called Boyd's. It's up uh, near Germantown. And it's an interesting community. It's sort of a black side and a white side and uh, all kinds of institutional buildings and residences that survive. Uh, but yeah, occasionally we find the stones Typically what we do when we, uh, we're doing a lot of this in Anne Arundel County, we're actually recreating plats for the entire first district of uh, Anne Arundel County as part of an agricultural uh, strategy study for the late 19th century. So we, we get the meets and bounds, we reconstruct them, uh, usually using, we actually have an Excel spreadsheet where you could just plug in the numbers and it recreates the plat for you. We then take that and put it into geographic information system and then that way we could see topography for each of those forms, hydrology. We have the agricultural census data from 1850 through 1880 that we can then attach to that polygon of the form. And so we got a lot of data coming together. It isn't easy to do, but it's, you can collect this stuff. You can run the title. If you run into a, a, a dead end, uh, you should contact me. I've been doing this 
for a very long time, there are ways of getting around those dead ends. Uh, it's usually because the land was inherited and so you use a combination of land records, ancestry.com and newspapers.com and you know, you could figure it out. Oh, thank um, you very much. Yes, Jim, what, what, what's a good website for folks to check out what's going on with uh, CERC and the SEAL team and when digs will be back and um, scheduled? Well, even in the best of times, uh, yeah, CERC, CERC has a, a website. Uh, there are web pages for the archaeology team. I can't remember. I don't think we've updated them since they were created. Uh, kind of more of a word of mouth kind of operation where you contact me or you contact somebody who's part of the team. And uh, we, we've, we're really terrible. The archaeologists are really terrible at going out and uh, you know, doing some sort of web presence. I give a lot of public lectures, so that's one way of connecting. Uh, but as far as the latest news, uh, <laughs> sorry, I don't have an answer for you. We have to work on that. Should, should um, if, if anybody wants to contact you, can I send them your way? My email address could be spread far and wide. My telephone number, I don't care. I pretty much work seven days a week anyway. So, you know, call, email, smoke signals, whatever. I'm happy to speak with folks. And I'm particularly uh, interested in speaking with young folks who are interested, not just in an archeology span career, but are trying to figure out how to build a professional career. We do a lot of that uh, in, at SEAL. Uh, we've had a number of high school students come through who've gone, gotten into colleges of their choice. We've had people come to us with undergraduate degrees and wanting to go some into archaeology, some in art history, Latin American studies, environmental, it doesn't matter. Uh, we give them a leg up by giving them an opportunity to develop professional experience, attend professional meetings, give papers on their work, build resume, and help them with applying to graduate schools because it is very competitive. Yeah. Uh, and so we serve an important function that, that way as well. Um, we have two questions about uh, the new growth forest kind of area. Um, Anthony wants to know, is there any way to go back in time to get an idea of what the soil and environment was like pre-Europeans? <laughs> and then Nancy on the same kind of situation um, that most of the forests are 60 to 80 years old. What was the land that was unsuitable for ag in this area used for that was too hilly or, or, or extremely rocky? So why, why aren't there any old growth if the land wasn't agriculturally suitable? Well, let me take the first question first. Um, most of the land in Southern Maryland, and this isn't true of the whole state, but in, in Southern Maryland, really you can plow just about anything that isn't a wetland or that you know, doesn't have a really steep slope you know, that goes down, you know, to a, a waterway. And those areas, the, 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 the steeper slopes were simply used as a source of timber for building and for fire, firewood. Uh, but anything that was reasonably level at one point or another was cultivated. And in Southern Maryland, except for the very Southern, uh, uh, southern part of St. Mary's County uh, was tobacco. Uh, St. Mary's County and the Eastern Shore did a lot of wheat, uh, but tobacco grew on just about anything. You know, how much you produce and the quality of it, of course, varied depending on the soils, but you could cultivate just about anything. Um, as far as trying to understand uh, pre-contact environments, archeologists can do that. When we find Native American sites, we can collect data on soils. Uh, if there's you know, burned organic material, we could find out what plants were there what, and what those plants were used for, for firewood or for food. Uh, we can potentially collect pollen and of course, uh, animal bones. We can do this. The problem is you need a lot of sites, you need a lot of archeologists and you need a lot of money. Uh, but yeah, each excavation potentially can produce data on that point about what the, uh, if you will, the pre-Columbian environment was like. Uh, but it's gonna take a long time to build that database. It's been a long time already. It'll be a long time more. 
but hey, join us, join in the fun, <laughs> help us collect those data. Um, Doug is interested in more information on the soil deposition in stream valleys and ongoing erosion. Uh, do you see that as a worthy effort to try to, to prevent ongoing stream erosion? We have a number of efforts. I know even in Anne Arundel County, well, the Smithsonian has done its own stream restoration um, and has been monitoring sediment loads in, 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 the, in the streams that cross the campus. I think it's one of the reasons why we own so much land so we can kind of control that laboratory space so we can see you know, what's going on. Uh, in Anne Arundel County, uh, there are groups that have been sponsoring stream restorations and the State Highway Administration does this as well. Basically trying to restore grades re to the point where the stream can actually overflow its banks the way it's supposed to do naturally, restoring soils and also re reducing the force of flow, reducing the down cutting. In my line of work, I'm out all the time, plague or no plague, I've never been busy this past year. I'm out in the woods all the time around streams and it's amazing how deeply incised many streams are. And that's because of stormwater runoff from hard surfaces. And so stream restoration is all about basically filling in those holes, grading the banks so the stream can flow more normally at a more gradual slope and when necessary, overflow its banks. Steve wants to know about enslaved people. Um, any property records on ages, sexes, and numbers on the two properties? We do have uh, from the 1850 and 1860 censuses, we have slave schedules. And so we know who owned how many slaves. Actually, we know that going back to, oh, I think going back to 1790. But beginning in 1850, we actually have details about specific ages and even uh, sex and name, that sort of thing. Um, the problem we're having is that just because a person owns a number of slaves, it doesn't mean those slaves resided on that particular property. That person could own more than one farm. They could lease out slaves to other plantation owners. They could lease out slaves to uh, tradesmen, blacksmiths and whatnot, carpenters. Uh, so we can get an idea of who's owning whom, but how they're distributed across the landscape is, is much more of a challenging question. We do, we can, we are beginning to link the folks that show up in those censuses with descendants today. Uh, I know around, you know, around Cirque, you know, most of the Smithsonian land was plantation of one sort or another at one time. And the people who were enslaved and then later tenanted, tenanted those farms, their families still live in the area. Those names haven't changed very much and they're all interrelated. So we do get that kind of connection. Um, there are some folks in Annapolis, uh, Janice Hayes Williams, uh, for instance, has been uh, a major force in doing that kind of research. And some of our folks, I think if uh, Joanne DeVincent's still on, this meeting, I think she's worked on that material at the State Archives. Great. Any other questions? You can open up your mic. Let me know. Raise your hand. Put it in the chat box. Turn your screen on so we can see your smiling face. Absolutely. No other questions, huh? It, it looks like you covered everything. <laughs> Which, you know. Wow, wow, what a force <laughs> of nature I must be, huh? Uh, I haven't begun to, to cover everything. Uh, there's an enormous amount to do. There's an enormous amount to learn. All I can say is it's a lot of fun doing this. Uh, I can say that as, a, as an archeologist myself, you know, if I had to just do this myself, I wouldn't get nearly as much done by collaborating with all these folks who now basically own the research, it's theirs, they do it. Uh, I get to be involved in so many different research topics. You know, we're looking at shell button making in the 20th century on the Eastern shore. We're looking at town formation. Uh, we're, we're looking at all kinds of different things and it's possible because people come together, work together uh, to create a nice collegial environment. And, 
it's a lot of fun. Uh, this this plague is really killing us. I mean, we are only we can have two or three folks in the lab at a time at this point. Is it easy to find the information on LIDAR and the Maryland land grant sites? Or? LIDAR is easy. Uh, takes a little bit of practice to use it, but it's absolutely free. Uh, folks can contact me. I can give them the URL for the LIDAR and for the Maryland State Archives. Maryland State Archives will ask you to subscribe. There's no money changing hands. It's just you sub subscribe. You get a username and password and you have access that also takes a little bit of practice, but again, I'm more than happy to help folks. It's an incredible tool that simply isn't available most other places in the country. I used to have to go to a courthouse, wherever I had a project, if I had a project near Hagerstown, I'd have to go up to Hagerstown, go to the courthouse and spend a day or more flipping through these huge ledgers to track land and, and sometimes having the book fall on me or having these people Title searches constantly chattering in my ear, driving me up the wall. Now I could do it from the comfort of my own home. And in some cases, you could also get plats, drawings of the property you're interested in. So I'm happy to walk people through that if they like. Everybody is given the high fives and kudos. Um, they all look smarter, the ones that have their, their videos on. I noticed uh, that. I <laughs> did, yeah, they, they do. And, uh, and I agree, um, I agree with Robin. We would love to hear more from you in the future because this was wonderful. It's wonderful learning from you. Um, and there is so much more to learn. I'm happy to talk about more stuff. We're doing actually with the St. Mary's County Library a monthly lecture. I think it's the last Monday of each month. I think you need a library card number to get into it. But I think any public library card will do. Um, on various and sundry archaeological subjects, and I'm happy to come back and talk to you guys more about other things. So it's been a pleasure. We'll take you up on that, Jim. Thank you so much. And everybody, thank you for joining us and learning with us um, tonight. I uh, hope that everybody stays safe and that we get to uh, see you again and play in person um, sooner rather than later. So um, if that's it, have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you soon. Don't forget map turtles tomorrow if you want to learn about map turtles. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you.